Want help to grow your business? Download Bryn, the world's first business advisor in your pocket. To find out more, visit Bryn.ai or search the App Store today. G'day, Nils Vesk from Innovate or Die. Welcome to this series where we're going to be looking at ways that you can bring commercial innovation to your organization and your business for great commercial gain. So you might be thinking, innovate or die, what a serious topic. Well, the reality is, unless we're innovating, we're either competing on price or we're playing catch up, trying to chase our competitors as they go out and capture the market. And innovation is such a crucial key element that we all need in our businesses today. And when I've worked with organizations around the world, there's one common problem that I find, and that is that there are too few innovations and they're just too far apart. And the number one cause behind all of this is our bias perception. The bottom line is the way that we've been taught to think about innovation has skewed the way that we think about innovating and the ways that we can come up with new ideas. And that can either be a good thing or a bad thing. And in these, each one of our episodes, we're going to be unpacking a model called innovation archetypes. Because if we can understand the biases of the most amazing professional innovators and use their best principles, then we can use that to create great commercial gain in our own organizations. So let's quickly unpack each one of these archetypes and phases so you've got an idea of what we're going to be doing in each episode. And so we have universally four phases of innovation when it comes to it. We've got the investigation phase, ideation, iteration, and commercialization. The investigation phase is all about looking for insights as to where we should be applying our thinking to generate brilliant ideas. The ideation phase is all about coming up with lots and lots of great ideas. And then this iteration phase is all about testing, piloting, and prototyping our ideas so we can minimize the risk while increasing our certainty. And finally, we've got the commercialization phase. This is all about taking our idea, building it, and then selling it to the masses so we can get a good commercial return. And each one of our episodes, we're going to unpack one of these expert archetypes so we can borrow and model them to get some great commercial results. So let's get ready to rock, innovate or die. G'day, welcome to Innovate or Die. This episode is all about how to innovate like a marketer to unearth the remarkable. Now let's face it. If we don't have a great idea and we don't market it, well, it's going to be hard for us to make money. We need to get it out there to the masses. And there are some amazing things that marketers do. Um, you know, they're great at finding out what's good. They're great at trying to work out why we should do things. And they're great at um, inviting people to become part of a cause or of a campaign. And I reckon there are three really commercial reasons why we actually want to innovate like a marketer. And the first one is that great marketers nowadays know that unless something is remarkable, people just switch off. So they know actually how to look through an existing business, whether it's yours or someone else's, and find out what actually pops, what's remarkable about what it is that you're doing, what you're selling, and the sort in order to sell it to the masses. The second thing, or the second conundrum as to why we want to innovate like a marketer, is that if no one actually knows about your product or your service, does your product or service even exist? It's like that old sort of saying, you know, if a tree falls in a forest and no one hears or sees it fall, did it actually fall down? And too often, um, I come across some really brilliant, innovative people who have some great inventions and products, but because it's not present, it's not marketed, no one knows about it, and therefore, it almost doesn't exist. And the third commercial reason why we really want to innovate like a marketer is that marketers know that it's not always about marketing to everyone. It's about often creating exclusivity. It's knowing who not to market to um, that enables us to create desire and the right type of uh, Im impetus for people to want to come and get our product or our service. So let's delve into that cool, crazy mind of the marketer and see what we can come up with. And I want to start with, a, I guess, a poster child when it comes to marketing. And one of the cool marketing poster childs I keep thinking of is a guy by the name of Seth Godin. If you haven't seen him before, he's a sort of bald-headed kind of American guy. He's probably one of the most influential marketers in the world. 
Now, a lot of people, if you haven't heard of Seth, he's written all kinds of amazing books, one of them called Purple Cow, and I'll talk to you a bit more about that. But um, a lot of people think, oh, he's written you know, you know, 20, 30 books on marketing, but what would he know? Well, actually, a lot of people don't know this, but um, he was responsible for being a, a massive turnaround for a, a tech organization which came up with a game. And part of the way he did that was by creating a community that would create an actual physical game. So people would create tribes that were interested in a particular product and process. He also was, for many, for, for a few years, the um, head of direct marketing at Yahoo in their heyday um, before he went off to do some other different things. So he actually has worked as a marketer, let alone does he just talk about. But the, the, one of the best concepts that I'm going to talk about and share that um, Seth Godin talks a lot about is the importance of being remarkable. And his concept here, which was reflected very well in his book called Purple Cow, is that if you're driving the country and you see a black and white cow, wow, there's a cool cow. But as soon as you see another one and another one, and before you know it, 10 minutes later, you've seen hundreds of these same Frisian or black and white cows. You go, oh, that's a bit boring. But a purple cow, now that would be something remarkable that you would remember. So our challenge when it comes to this business concept nowadays is we need to be mindful of how can we create the remarkable. So when we think about things like, you know, what is remarkable about our product or our service, the challenge that we have in marketing for many people is that we think we just have to show people what it is that we do. We just need to tell them about our product. We just need to do it, get the, get the name out there. And frank, unfortunately, that's just not the case because everyone else is doing the same thing. So we need to think, what is it? That's remarkable about what we do. So we might think, is there something remarkable about how we work? Is it that we work, if I was a service industry, that we work in your organization? We come in and we set up office and we make it all happen there. Is it that we do it remotely? Is it that we do it offshore so it saves you money? I don't know. How do we do it at work? What's something remar remarkable about our costing model? Do we do it in a different way? So, for example, when a maybe uh, a normal accountant or a normal lawyer might charge on billable hours, the number of hours, what if they said, no, it's not on hours. We're going to have a, a fixed fee um, with a lump sum dependent on your success or whatever it might be. We might change a costing model. We might think about what's remarkable about our usability, how, amazing, how amazingly usable it is to use this clicker, or um, you know, how amazing our visibility might be around our product. We might think again, it's this remarkable, what's remarkable about the automation of our website or our processing fee or our, our um, let's call it, I don't know, our pricing or our appraisal process. What might be remarkable about the interactions that we have with our customers? Is it that it's super short? Is it that it's longer? Is it that we really get to know you and what your issues are? What is it that's remarkable about our advisability? That is how we share our information. Uh, you know, one of the things that sets myself apart from a lot of my competition is a lot of speakers or experts might just do conferences. Uh, we run videos, we run workshops, we do consulting, we do training, we print and produce books. We do all kinds of different things. But what's remarkable about your advisability compared to your competition? What's remarkable about the efficiency that you've got? Is it that you use processes to get things done? Is it that you have um, you know, a special template or a certain technique to make those things happen? These are some of these elements that we want to consider. What's remarkable about the physical product itself? Is it that it's never been done before? Is it that it's lightweight? Is it that it's heavy? That it's made out of you know, amazingly environmentally sensitive products? Came across a guy the other day who had some cool glasses, not, not as cool as these ones. And um, you know, we were talking, he was an environmental, you know, amazing kind of guy. And I said, wow, they're pretty cool glasses. He said, you know what? They're actually made from fishing nets. And so what, there was this organization that said, we think there's a, you know, all of these fishing nets, the old fishing nets are killing um, marine life. So they started to collect them all and they said, what could we do with them? And they thought, well, let's actually melt them down. And they started to make things like um, sunglass frames and all kinds of groovy products. Now that's a remarkable story, as you could imagine, would get people interested in buying those super cool shades. Not as cool as these ones though. <laughs> um, 
Um, so what else? You know, what's remarkable about the physicality? That is how easy it is or what we do and where we operate. So you're getting the message. If we can uncover what it is that's remarkable about what it is that we do, then it gets much easier to share that story. Which leads us on to this component, which is marketing really is storytelling. The only challenge we have is that anyone can tell a story, but a story may not necessarily be good. So part of the art of the marketer when it comes to telling and sharing a story is, as I said before, is about finding and unearthing something is remarkable about it, and then looking the way that can craft the message or the story in a way that might be authentic and relates to the values and the brand that you might stand for. Because it's no point hiring some sort of ex-newsreader to talk about my innovative product, because it just doesn't fit the brand of what I'm trying to communicate. So this is part of the thing around storytelling. And when I think of storytelling from a marketing perspective, I can't go past a guy by the name of Gary Vaynerchuk. If you haven't heard of him, check it out. Even if you have a guess at his name, phonetically Vaynerchuk, you'll come across him. Now, um, Gary Vaynerchuk came to fame. He had a, uh, his whole family had a wine and um, alcohol business, liquor stores and things like that. And one of the concepts he got on very, very early days um, around YouTube was he created a little video YouTube channel called um, the Wine, Wine Library or Wine TV Library. And one of the things that was so fascinating about this was that he didn't actually make the videos with the intent to sell on the episode. So he wasn't going, look at this fantastic bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon, blah, 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 blah. To continue enjoying this presentation, download Bryn, the world's first business advisor in your pocket. To find out more, visit Bryn.ai or search the App Store today.